Hello and welcome to this Australian Biocommons webinar. My name is Melissa Burke and I'm the Australian Biocommons Training and Communications Officer. I'll also be your host for this webinar. In these webinars, we aim to share useful information about the latest digital techniques, data and tools that are available to the life sciences community. Each month, we hear from our national and international peers on a bioinformatics topic that we hope will support Australian researchers to achieve their best medical, agricultural and environmental research. You can keep up to date with the latest Biocommons news and events through the links that are listed on your screen. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. In my case, in Brisbane, this is the Turrbal and Yagara people. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. And we recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Today, we're joined by Dr. Georgina Samaha, who is going to talk to us about getting started with whole genome mapping and variant calling on the command line. Georgie is a senior bioinformatics officer with the Sydney Informatics Hub, and she has a PhD in genomics from the Veterinary Science School at the University of Sydney. In her role, she's working to make bioinformatics more accessible to researchers by developing scalable and reproducible bioinformatics workflows. We're really excited to have Georgie along today to share some of her work and insights into workflows for genome mapping and variation. Welcome to the webinar, Georgie, and I will hand over to you to start with the talk for today. Uh, so thank you very much for having me today. So I'm just going to give you a little extra um, background, I guess, on why I'm giving the webinar today. So like Melissa said, as a bioinformatician at the Sydney Informatics Hub, um, my group is also actually a partner of the Australian Biocommons uh, Bring Your Own Data Command Line Interface Project. Um, so that means we're working with a group of bioinformaticians and um, computing specialists and service providers um, from around the country at different facilities. So it's all the facilities that are li listed here on the slide. Um, so we're all basically working together to make uh, doing bioinformatics at the command line easier. Um, we know how hard this work can be, you know, especially we think it's hard for those of us who don't have much formal training or, or much experience. Um, so we're all developing um, some infrastructure and resources, that, and that includes things like um, best practice workflows um, to help you do bioinformatics at the command line as life scientists. Um, mapping and variant calling pipelines have um, been a big focus of ours recently, um, and it's not just because uh, it's a really popular application across a lot of um, different life science disciplines, but it's also um, pretty computationally challenging. Um, so today we're, we're really covering the workflow basics. Um, and that's with the intention of giving you an understanding of what's best practice and also a sort of framework that you can apply to your own research. So that means we're, we're going to be talking at the workflow level rather than the tool level today. Um, we think there's already you know, a lot of information and training online about um, how you might run the different steps involved in this process um, and how you write the code, write the commands out. Um, and in our work supporting researchers, you know, we find that oftentimes people want help with um, some of the higher level challenges they experience when, um, when doing bioinformatics. So that includes things like um, uh, getting the workflow running on your compute environment um, and also knowing what's you know, best practice in your own applications. Um, it can be really hard to, to know where to start with this sort of work. Um, you know, if you open the methods section of, of genomics papers, Everyone seems to do things a little bit differently, and it can be really hard to get your head around why they chose such different paths, especially if you're new to next generation sequencing and working at the command line. And of course, often in you know, the method sections of those papers, people don't include all the, the trial and error work they had to get to, um, to that final um, uh, design that they, that they applied. Um, so we're going to talk through the general workflow structure. We're also going to talk about how different the workflow can look in practice when applied to different data sets. And then we're going to get into some of the key things to know uh, when you're applying this work to your own project. Um, so, you know, that includes things like how you might want to choose a, an existing best practice pipeline to use instead of building your own. Um, and we're also, of course, going to talk about some of the national compute facilities that um, are available to you for doing this work if you'd like to use them. 
Uh, so just to clarify, um, uh, today we're talking specifically about mapping and variant calling in the germline uh, with short read sequence data. So that's, you know, short read sequencing is the dominant technology right now, so that's why it's our focus. Um, you can probably extrapolate a lot of what's covered today to other technologies like uh, long read sequencing and maybe some other variant types like somatic variants if you're working with cancer genomes or structural variants. Um, but some of the steps will be different and a lot of the tools are different. Um, so uh, we're, we're focusing on uh, single nucleotide variants and short indels. So that means we're looking at um, just single base pair changes um, as variants and um, insertions and deletions that are, are typically less than um, 30 base pairs long. So if we start from the beginning, right, at the beginning of our experiment, let's say we've isolated the genomic DNA from a set of samples and we set them off for sequencing. The data that's going to be returned to us by a sequencing company, uh, it's going to be in a raw chopped up form and you're going to need to process it before you can analyze it and interpret it. Um, the sequencing company will probably send you your raw sequence data as fast Q files. Um, and to transform your FASTQ files and your reads into an aligned genome level sequence, so a big continuous uh, sequence at the chromosome level um, that you can use to identify variants, you're first going to have to um, check that your raw data is clean enough for you to construct that map and reliably call variants. You're then going to have to align those reads in the FASTQ files uh, to a reference genome of your choice. And um, from that process, you're going to get a BAM file. So that's really just a, a map of the aligned genome um, for a single sample. Uh, we're then going to take that BAM file and take that reference genome again. And we're going to basically look at the alignment base by base, so per nucleotide. And you're going to identify sites where the genotype in your samples don't match the reference. Um, and those variant sites are going to be output in a uh, what's called a VCF file, which you might then filter and annotate so you can get a sense of, um, of their impact and maybe make, start making that connection between genotype and phenotype that you're really interested in. Um, the process is, is a lot more complicated, I guess, than I, I just made it sound. Uh, most of the stages I talked about comprise multiple steps, which are each performed by a different tool. And some of these steps are really computationally intensive, especially for those of us who work with large or complex genomes like mammals, um, maybe some bird species and some plant species as well. So um, to start with, we're just going to go through the, those three file types um, and what they look like. And then we're going to talk through the steps that we typically uh, perform with this workflow. Um, and then we're going to cover the sort of questions you're going to need to ask of your own project to understand your own needs. Uh, so up here on the slide, got an example of a FASTQ file. So FASTQ files are the standard output of high throughput sequencing machines these days. Um, it's usually going to be given to you as a G, in a gzipped format. So you might see it have uh, the file extension .fastq.gz. That just means the file's compressed to save space. Um, so you know each read within um, a FASTQ file is going to take up four lines in that file. The first line is a header. Um, so the header is going to contain some information about the sequence identifier um, and some other information about the sequencing of that read. Um, the second line is the read itself. So it's just each of the bases. So you might see, um, you might also see some N, some bases called as N there. Um, that, that's just bases that can't reliably be called as, you know, either A, C, T or G. Um, the third line is a separator line. So that's just a, a plus sign. Uh, the fourth is a base a per base quality score. Um, the score we used here we use here is called a Fred scaled score. So basically for each base, for each of the, the bases above it, you're just going to have a character that represents some, some numerical score. And this is a standardized format that you can um, you can easily look up online. So once we have the reads in the FASTQ files and we've aligned them, um, they're going to be output as a, as a BAM file. And this is a binary representation of the alignment map. Um, you're not going to be able to read it, like just open it up on, on the command line without um, using a specialized tool. Um, you may have also heard of SAM files, which are basically the text file equivalent of a BAM file. Uh, and we typically use BAMs instead of SAMs here because they are um, highly compressed. So, sorry, they take up um, a lot less disk space and they're also more computationally efficient for, for software to use than SAM files. Um, both BAMs and SAMs have a header line at the top of the file. 
Um, these lines mostly contain information about the file as a whole, so about the alignment process that's been used to generate the files. Um, if someone were to give me a BAM file, um, but say they were unsure of, of what reference genome it had been mapped to, for example, um, I could find this information in the header if I was interested. Um, BAM files also contain, of course, the read information um, with the read, the read sequence itself and some added information about where the read mapped to in the genome. And they also still have that per base uh, quality score and some additional predefined tags, which give you um, some additional information um, on the alignment or the read. So that third file is called the variant call format file. So that's the product of variant calling. So we've used the BAMs and the reference genome to call our variants and they're gonna be output as a VCF, right? It's human readable, it's divided into two main parts. The top part of the file um, contains header lines. So similar to a BAM file, the header contains information about the, the file as a whole, um, including how it was generated. Um, and below the header, you're going to have the, the actual variant information um, uh, for your samples. Um, so you're going to have a variant site record for each uh, variant position that you identified in the genome. Um, and you're also gonna have corresponding genotype data for each sample that's included in the VCF. Um, some samples, some VCFs, sorry, are going to contain only one sample and others might contain multiple samples um, in, in that one file. And we're going to talk a little bit about how you um, might decide whether or not to generate a, a single or a multi-sample VCF in a little bit. Uh, so that's the, you know, the three files that we're processing with this workflow. Today, we're really talking about GATK's best practice germline variant calling workflow. Um, GATK stands for Genome Analysis Toolkit. It's a, uh, an open source collection of command line tools for analyzing high throughput sequencing data, and they have a really big focus on variant discovery. Um, uh, you probably need to remember if you're um, someone who doesn't who works with non-human non organisms, um, it was primarily developed and tested on human genomes. So these genomes are pretty large and, and they're diploid. Um, however, it is commonly applied and adapted to other organisms, and that includes non-model organisms and organisms that might have different ploidy levels. So this does include um, birds and plants and microbes as well. Um, if you're someone maybe who comes from a wet lab background, it's, it's probably safe to assume that in your experiments, you make sure your protocols are well documented, they're optimized and they're performed consistently so that you ensure your results are reproducible. Um, GATK best practices approach to variant calling is basically the same thing. Um, when you're working with sequencing data, it's really important that you standardize your approach as best you can to ensure reproducibility of your results. It's currently the industry standard for identifying SNPs and indels in the germline DNA. Um, and it's able to handle, like I said before, organisms with different ploidy levels. So that also does make it suitable for applications like pooled uh, sample sequencing and polyploid genomes. Um, and while you know, GATK is itself a, a suite of software tools that you can use to perform various tasks, you aren't obliged to use all of their tools when you're following this workflow um, to a best practice standard. I think it's really important to mention here that while you know, these best practices are, are broadly applied, there are plenty of situations in which you would need to diverge from this process. Um, you know, for example, you might substitute a GATK tool for a more computationally performant tool that, that runs faster while maintaining the same rough level of accuracy, or maybe it's even got a better accuracy than its GATK counterpart. That would still meet GATK best practice standards. Um, so we're just gonna go through first all the, the different steps um, that are covered here on, the, on that blue line, um, and then we'll get down to a, the practical example. So first step, as I mentioned before, um, that is quality control of your raw data. So try and keep in the back of your head that uh, next generation sequencing, right, we generate very high volumes of data and it can be quite error prone. Um, no sequencing technology is going to be perfect and um, each run and instrument is going to generate different types and amounts of errors and sources of bias that might incorrectly, uh, might result in us, you know, incorrectly calling nucleotides. Um, and that might affect our downstream work. So we perform initial quality control to identify and if necessary, uh, clean any potential sources of errors that might impact uh, downstream analyses. So that might help us improve our accuracy downstream. 
Uh, the next step is aligning all the sequence reads in those FASTQ files to a reference genome. So we're, we're still performing these steps for each sample separately. Um, the quality of your alignment is really going to depend on the quality of your input data and the reference genome you get it, you give it, sorry. Um, more and more these days, you know, reference genomes are being developed for, for different species. A reference genome, if you don't know, it's, it's basically just a, a nucleic acid sequence database. So it's assembled as a, a set um, a representative basically of the genomic sequence and set of genes that um, uh, are, you know, in a representative individual of a, an organism of a certain species. And we use these references to create those maps for each of our samples. So we generally sequence enough reads and we extract enough DNA um, from our samples to um, map the majority of the genome at a pretty reliable uh, sequencing depth. And we make sure that we've got enough reads that cover all the bases to allow us to accurately um, perform uh, variant calling. And this can really vary, the, the depth that is required can really vary um, depending on your application. But you know, generally best, it's recommended that you have at least in mammals, as far as I'm aware, th about 30 time read depth. Um, but of course, it's you know, not always possible. Uh, so after we've generated those initial BAM files, we still need to do a little bit more quality control to identify some sources of sequencing error and bias that uh, we couldn't pick up from the raw data. So during the sequencing process, the same fragment of DNA might be sequenced several times. Um, and this might result in the generation of duplicate reads. So uh, these duplicate reads are typically not informative. We don't consider them to be evidence for or against a potential uh, variant site. Um, they typically arise actually during the library preparation process before sequencing even occurs. Um, and depending on the type of library preparation that uh, is being performed or the sequencing company has performed for you, your duplicate reads might be the result of PCR amplification uh, or optical duplicates as well. So what we do is we, we just tag these reads so that um, downstream variant calling tools know that these reads originated from the same fragment of DNA and that they shouldn't be used to, um, uh, you know, for or against a, a certain variant site. Uh, another potential error correction step that we perform on BAM files is called base quality score recalibration. Variant calling algorithms rely really heavily on the quality scores that are assigned to those individual base calls in every sequence read. Um, quality scores can tell us basically how much we can trust that particular observation. Um, so we know that the base quality scores that are emitted by sequencing machines can be biased or inaccurate. So this step, we, um, we can apply a machine learning model um, that basically just models these errors empirically and tries to adjust them accordingly. So it tries to kind of standardize things a bit better, clean things up. Um, to do this, however, you do need to have a set of uh, known variants that are specific to your population. So it's a population level data set um, of common variants. Um, and because this is not always um, uh, commonly available in a lot of species, especially if you're working with a non-model species, um, I wouldn't say that this, this step is always performed. I don't think it's, it's always mandatory. It really depends on your project and your data. Sometimes you can actually also overcorrect with this step and penalize or overlook true variants. Um, and that can impact things like rare variants if that's your focus of your project. Uh, alignment quality control, this step is pretty self-explanatory. You know, we should collect summary stats about the quality of our alignment to see how well the tools and our data performed. Um, we can check things like, you know, that the mapping and the sequencing depth are consistent, you know, so it's what we expect to see and things like the distribution of mapped and unmapped reads across the genome. Um, uh, so then, the, you know, after we've basically got our BAM files, the, the main step in identifying those variant sites um, is, is this point here. So we're still working at the sample, the sample level here. This step itself can be broken up into a few different stages. It really depends on, uh, you know, mainly if you're performing uh, joint genotyping downstream. Um, so the tools we use here and the algorithms that, that they employ um, have varying levels of sensitivity and specificity. Sometimes they can mistake sequencing errors that slip through for true variants. We mistake for true variants. So we do need to do some filtering later on generally to handle that. 
Um, so in this step, basically once the, the joint genotyping step, once we've performed an initial variant calling, and we've basically identified all the variant sites across um, the genome of a single individual, we might then choose to perform an additional step called joint genotyping, where we consider multiple samples um, at the same time. And we use multiple samples to produce a cohort level set of variants. So using this process, we can um, improve our sensitivity to detect rare variants and also variants at uh, difficult sites in the genome like repetitive regions. It can also be really useful for um, load sequencing pro projects. So you might have a, a read depth of only about you know, 10 times coverage. Um, and uh, this step here can really help you reduce false positives. Um, however, it does have some uh, significant practical drawbacks that mean it's, mean it's not always practical or useful. Um, so these include things like poor scaling. So it can take a lot of compute power and a lot of time to run, um, especially if you're processing a really large cohort of samples. So it's not always suitable for, for big cohorts, right, when you're looking at, um, at hundreds of samples at the same time. Uh, but regardless of whether or not you do joint calling, so you have the multi-sample VCF or you have a single sample VCF, you're going to need to perform some quality checks and collect metrics from your variant set to help you fine tune the resulting data set and kind of, a, you know, achieve an optimal performance. Um, so we look at various metrics to evaluate biological accuracy of your pipeline. You can use these to guide you in variant filtering. Um, and filtering can involve the application of hard filtering thresholds. So for example, you might just um, have a, a blanket rule of removing variants under a certain quality threshold, or you might want to apply more dynamic processes. So uh, one of these more dynamic processes is called variant quality score recalibration, where we empirically model the quality scores of some known variants in the like variants that are known to exist in the population. Um, this process, uh, you know, similar to base quality score recalibration, it can be vulnerable to overcorrection. Um, and like, I guess the same as with base quality score calibration as well, it does require the use of that population level variant data set, which is not typically available to a lot of different species. Uh, so the final step is variant annotation. Um, this is optional, of course, you know, it, it might help you prioritize your variants and understand their functional consequences. Um, it can involve annotating functional information like uh, the predicted impact of a variant on a gene, as well as um, population frequency information. So you can identify uh, novel versus um, you know, known, uh, known variants. So now we have a sense of the general steps that make up this process. We're going to look at um, what this process actually looks like in practice. Um, bioinformatics workflows like mapping and variant calling can sometimes be really hard to standardize for a few different reasons. Um, that mostly comes back to the fact that biology is really complex and it doesn't often adhere to the nice, neat rules that are expected of traditional computing. It's, it's not very easy for us to understand um, exactly how much computing power we're going to need to do this kind of work all the time. Uh, so, um, you know, looking at these, these genomics projects as, as examples of how different studies have constructed their mapping and variant calling workflows, you know, we can see straight away there's a lot of variation in how different researchers apply these best practices to their projects. So, for example, if you look at the, the human uh, cancer example here, so it's the one with the, the little baby, um, this study diverged from GATK best practices by excluding base quality score recalibration and joint genotyping. Um, and they did this because, you know, this work that was performed in a clinical context, they had collaborators, so they needed to make sure their, their workflow was consistent with um, their collaborators who didn't perform these steps. Um, but they were also wary of overcorrecting and potentially excluding uh, clinically relevant variants during those filtering steps. Uh, and when we, you know, we add the, the tool layer, right? Remember I said that a lot of, there are a lot of different bioinformatic tools out there um, that serve the same function. You're not obliged to use those GATK uh, tool options. So things change even more when, when we're, we're looking at the different tools people use for each of these steps. Um, all these tools differ slightly in the algorithms they employ, their sensitivity, um, their outputs and their computational resource efficiency. So if we look at that human cancer example again, this group was working with 700 samples, right? The 700 human whole genome samples is a very big data set. So that meant their workflow had to be optimized to be computationally efficient. 
um, because if we were going to run it without any uh, any optimization, every sample was going to take days to run. And then, you know, that stretches out when we've got 700 samples to months, probably like a, almost a year's worth of, uh, of computing time. Um, so this group did um, optimize their workflow at a higher level, but they also chose to, to include um, uh, different features like they, they chose to substitute GATK's mark duplicate tool with a tool called Sam Bamba um, that was more performant. It run, runs much faster. So as with the workflow design, software choice for each of these steps is going to be dependent um, on the context of your project. Another thing that's really important to consider is the differences in user experience and processing time in different workflows. So you, of course, might choose to write your own pipeline as a series of scripts that process one sample at a time. You might be OK manually running those scripts. Um, but sometimes we need to repeat the analyses regularly or process large numbers of samples at once, or we want to work quickly or automate things. So um, we design the pipeline to be run differently. Um, there are a lot of different ways to do this. And here we're just looking at three existing optimized mapping and variant calling pipelines that we're going to talk about a little bit later as some um, maybe some good options for you. Um, so, uh, you know, there are a lot of different ways to do this. Um, this is a plot um, from a comparison study that we did last year. We tested these pipelines at NCI, so it's National Computer Infrastructure, it's HPC, it's called Guardi. Um, we ran each of the pipelines on the same data set of six human whole genome samples, and we compared how computationally efficient they were, how biologically accurate they were, and you know, what their user experience was like. Um, we found that they were each optimized for a different purpose. So the Parabrix pipeline down the bottom, that can be run with only a few steps, right? So you've got a different color for each of the, basically each of the commands that we had to run. Um, if you compare that with the pipeline above it, the Sydney Informatics Hub pipeline that was developed by some of my colleagues, um, that had a separate script that, uh, that a user needs to run for each step. So there's a lot of manual intervention there. And then if you compare both of those with the NF Core SARIC pipeline at the top, um, that pipeline lets you run the whole thing with only one command. So, you know, that makes Parabricks and NF course SARIC pipelines easier to run for beginners, but we also found it made them slightly less flexible. So they were less well suited for advanced users who needed to customize things. Um, there's also obviously a really dramatic difference in runtime. So while SARIC was optimized for easy running, it wasn't optimized for speed in the way that um, Parabricks and the Sydney Informatics Hub pipelines were. Um, all this information is in a public report. Um, I've got the DOI linked here. Um, you're welcome to read it. It might be a good point of reference if you want to see how much the compute, how much compute resources are required to run all the steps in this workflow. Uh, so yeah, that's a lot of information, a lot of different things to consider. So maybe to make it easier to digest and understand in a practical context, we're going to go through an example project and the decision making process that we used. Um, so this is a real project. So the decision-making process we use to decide on a pipeline uh, to process a, a, a whole genome sample, a whole genome sequencing um, sample set. So we were working with dogs here. Um, this is a project we worked on last year. Uh, the researchers that we did this work for, they had a really big cohort of 110, um, sorry, 110 um, whole genome dog samples. Uh, their group, were, they look at heritable diseases and traits in companion animals, they particularly look at dogs. And I guess like a lot of groups do, they had accumulated a really big cohort of samples over the years with various research projects, and they needed to update all their samples because a new reference genome uh, assembly had been published in the dogs, and that was the, the new standard um, in the community. Um, and they regularly use this cohort to validate variants of interest in lots of different projects. Um, and that included a, a current paper that they wanted to publish. So they came to us and asked us to perform the mapping and variant crawling work for them. They had a number of requirements that we needed to factor in. Uh, firstly, the data set um, that we generated, that was going to be used, like I said, for validation in various studies. So it gave us an indication of the steps we needed to include in the workflow. And um, from a quick literature review and a chat with the researchers, we knew that um, GATK best practices would suffice here. Um, 110 dog genomes is a really big data set. The dog genome is over 2.5 gigabases long. Um, and in their, in their case, that translated to over three terabytes of input data. So we knew that the pipeline was probably going to have to be optimized for a specialized computing resources. So we're probably gonna to have to work at a, at a high performance computer. 
And this was confirmed by their need for fast turnaround time and their desire for um, a joint called final VCF. So remember that's just one VCF file that contains variant call information and, and genotypes for all 110 samples at once. Um, and finally, as um, Sydney Uni researchers, we knew that they had access to the university's high performance computer. Um, however, we know from our own experience that the facility is limited in the amount of disk space it has to, to store all the input and output data. Um, it's used by a lot of different people. Um, so we thought the workflow might be better suited to a national high performance computer um, that not only had more storage space, more disk space for us to use, but also had um, you know, more CPUs, more memory, that kind of stuff, more resources for us to play with when we're to process our samples. So like I already said, we went to the literature, we confirmed the sort of workflow um, that was considered best practice in canines, and that was the GATK workflow, um, and that included joint calling. Um, so that gave us a good indication of the steps we needed to run and also the preferred tools that we should use to run each step. Um, remember, in bioinformatics, we're spoiled for choice, right? There's always a lot of different tools that are designed to perform the same function. Um, and if this project was more specialized or, or let's say was being performed in a, a diagnostic context or something where we needed to be far more stringent, we might apply additional best practice guidelines or, or use tools a different bit differently. So what's best practice really depends on the research question. It can be high level guidance or it can be specific to a, a particular application. Um, and one thing I think is really important to remember here is that as technologies change, what is defined as best practice will also change. So you might be given, for example, some, someone in your lab might give you their old scripts from a few years ago, um, and they tell you that they meet those GATK best practice standards. However, um, you know, you need to have in the back of your mind that the tools that were considered best practice a few years ago might not be the same tools that are best practice now. And even if the tools are the same, chances are that the tools have been updated uh, a number of times and the newer versions, most more current versions, um, are far more accurate and efficient than um, those used in the past were. So it's important to apply current best practices. Um, and if you need some guidance on this, um, GATK document them really clearly on their website. You basically just need to Google um, GATK best practices and, and you'll find it immediately. So after we had a look at the, you know, we had that base structure, we knew what workflow roughly we were going to be using. Um, the next thing we looked at was the data, right? So we, we asked how was the data structured? Um, and this not only included uh, input data, um, so those fast Q files, the raw data, but it also included things like the reference genome and any additional known variant data sets that we might be using. So if we start with the inputs, as I mentioned before, the, the dog genome is quite large. So we had about three terabytes of input data in those fast Q files. Um, a general rule of thumb you can maybe rely on is that um, BAM files are generally gonna be roughly the same size as their fast Q file counterparts. Um, for a sample, usually just a little bit bigger. So that was um, another about three terabytes of data that we were as we were going to have to deal with just as output. And you know, off the top of my head, I can't even really get my head around um, how many intermediate files we were going to generate and how much you know scratch space, how much temporary, how much disk space we were going to need to temporarily store those files as well. Um, if you wanted to work that that out exactly, if you wanted to have precise numbers. Um, for how much disk and how much computing resources, so CPU and memory you're going to need. Um, the, the approach I would take was once I've worked out the pipeline that I want to use, I would run either a subsetted sample or, or just one sample through all the steps in the pipeline. I would calculate the compute resources it took um, to run um, the whole thing and how much data it generated, and I would extrapolate that to, to a bigger cohort. Um, another thing that um, you need to think about here in terms of the data is the reference genome I'm using. So dogs are considered a, a model species. So um, anyone doing whole genome mapping and variant calling in dogs is going to have access not only to a public reference genome um, that they can download from Ensemble or UCSC or NCBI websites, but they're also going to have access to a set of known variants. Um, so variants that are known to exist in the general canine population across lots of different breeds. Um, if we're working with a non-model species that maybe doesn't have an available reference genome, so say we've got to perform a cross-species alignment using a close, close relative, 
We're going to be limited in our ability to apply all those best practice steps to our data. Um, so that means we probably won't reliably be able to do things like base quality score recalibration or variant quality score recalibration either. Um, so yeah, they're the things to keep in mind. So, you know, from all of this, I've got an even clearer sense of the overall workflow process design I want to use. I have a sense of the sort of computing resources I'm going to need. Um, and I know that I'm probably going to need some kind of um, a specialized high performance computer to, to get the work done. Um, the third thing I think is, you know, really important to think about here, especially if you're a beginner, is what do you need to run the workflow successfully as a user? Um, you know, if you want to, of course, you can build your own pipeline from scratch, but that can be quite challenging and quite time consuming if you're new to the command line or new to working on um, high performance computers or, or cloud computing. Um, it's also especially hard if you're working with bigger data sets or more complex data sets, because that means you're going to have to be very aware of the kind of resources you need, and you probably need um, specialized compute. So um, an alternative you might want to consider is using an existing workflow. Um, more and more these days, you know, we're seeing researchers and developers um, create reproducible pipelines that they make public. Um, and sometimes it's more convenient to use these than to develop our own. Or if you still want to develop your own, you can, you know, very heavily borrow from or be influenced by how people um, have done it in the past, um, looking at these workflows. So in the case of, of this canine project that we're talking about, uh, we had a few things to consider in terms of user experience. Um, and remembering um, that the researchers had a really tight timeline, we wanted to use an existing pipeline um, to make better use of our time. Because we know, you know, like it might be okay for us to, to develop the timeline, but the, the pipeline, but given the researchers had such a big data set, we were going to have to do a lot of uh, resource, resource optimization work, and that was going to be very time consuming. Um, so we'd already gathered from, you know, looking at our data set, we were going to need to not only have a clear sense of the resource requirements because um, we were going to be working at a special HPC. Um, we needed to know those resource requirements because working at those, so if we're going to apply to use a national facility, um, we have to make a special application to use those systems. And those applications require us to be quite explicit in our requests. Um, but, you know, another thing we were uh, also going to, you know, to get it running, uh, to get it all running successfully, another thing we had to consider um, was, you um, uh, the experience of, uh, you know, how easy is this pipeline going to be to run? So, um, you know, for us, this was okay. You know, we were, we're comfortable working on specialized infrastructures. We're comfortable working on the command line because we're, we're bioinformaticians um, and we work on these national HPCs all the time. So we're experienced in using their infrastructure. Um, we also knew that we didn't really need to customize the standard workflow too much, um, but that maybe, you know, we'd want to keeping in the back of our mind that the GATK best practices workflow is mainly tested and developed for humans. And we're working with a non-human species here. So maybe we did need to adjust some of the parameters for some steps like the variant quality score recalibration, um, you know, maybe the, the variant filtering steps um, to fine tune things. So overall, we knew we were probably looking for an existing workflow um, that could accommodate the sort of parameter adjustments that we, we might wanna make. Um, and we knew we needed a workflow um, that would be able to run on a specialized infrastructure as well. Um, this level of consideration isn't always necessary, but it, it does pop up when you're dealing with bigger data sets. So for those of you who are in the processing a few samples at a time or, or working with really small genomes, you're probably perfectly fine so long as you have an understanding roughly of how, you know, some basic basic working at the command line. And if you have access to an HPC or a small computing cluster or something through your institution, so long as you understand um, how you can inter how you have to interact with that system and how that system works roughly, um, you should be fine. Um, another thing, you know, if you feel like you really aren't sure what you're doing and you don't want to play around with things too much, you don't need to worry um, about things like customizing your parameters because, you know, most tools broadly perform really well with their default parameters. So it's typically safe um, to use these without any adjustment. Uh, so in terms of what we got from, you know, thinking about the project and asking all those questions, we knew we were looking for an existing pipeline um, with the following features, right? We wanted something that uh, ran GATK best practices. We wanted something that had a limited need for customization, but we didn't need, uh, but we also, you know, did need something that um, was uh, optimized 
and scalable. So it could scale out to processes 110 samples efficiently. Um, we are really comfortable doing bioinformatics on the command line and working with HPC. So we weren't really looking for a pipeline that was um, too easy to use. So in terms of where you can look for these existing workflows, there are plenty of resources out there. Um, firstly, if you have no idea where to start, you have colleagues who do this work or you have access to uh, support staff like bioinformaticians like me at your research, your institution's uh, research core facilities, you might want to ask them for some tips. Um, you can also always check the methods sections of most genomics papers these days. They often you know, cite or include the code that they use to process their samples. Uh, another place to look if you're a beginner who wants something easy to run, um, something that's well supported, popular in the community is the NF Core repository. Um, NF Core is a community curated set of pipelines that are free to use. They're generally best practice and they're written in Nextflow, which is a, a workflow management tool, um, but you don't need to know how to write Nextflow or how to read it in order to run these pipelines. They come with very clear instructions um, and their pipelines are generally quite flexible and give you a lot of different tool options for some of the, the stages if you, if you have those preferences. Um, if you're feeling a bit more open-minded and confident, you might want to check out Workflow Hub and Workflow Finder. They're both pretty new platforms, um, so they're going to grow as people add more to them over the coming years. Um, the Australian Biocommons has a dedicated working space on Workflow Hub. Um, it's an international registry of published scientific workflows. There's a lot in there, um, and there's a lot more variety there, and typically you might find a, a few different options for the same workflow. I know there are a few different mapping and variant calling workflows there. Um, another place to look if you're comfortable with working on the command line and writing code is GitHub. Uh, GitHub is a, a public code repository for all sorts of projects, um, but you'll need to search for some specific terms. Um, and we hope that we host our public pipelines there in the Sydney Informatics Hub repository if, um, if you'd like somewhere to start. So back to the dogs, we looked through those repositories. We came out with a short list of pipeline options. So that included that NF Core pipeline. Like I said, it's open source, so it's free to download and use really easy to install and run. You basically only need to have Nextflow installed to get it running. Um, but while it's designed to process samples in parallel, you basically just give it a, a list of your samples and, and submit that and uh, it splits, um, separates the jobs out and runs them all in parallel for you. Um, it wasn't, this pipeline isn't actually really optimized to function at the scale that we needed to. So if you remember back to that plot I showed you comparing the pipeline runtimes, um, SARIC took about 18 hours to get from fast queues to VCF and it also couldn't perform that joint calling step that we were really interested in. Um, another option we considered um, that uh, was mentioned in that plot I showed you earlier is a commercially licensed software called Parabricks. Parabricks uses specialized hardware um, called GPUs to really speed up processing time. And this would have been a great option for us, but we didn't have access to the number of licenses that we needed to run this many samples um, in parallel very quickly. Uh, the third option, like I said, we really weren't keen on developing our own pipeline because we didn't have much time. So the final option we ended up with was a pipeline that had been developed by some of my colleagues. Um, uh, we'd used the pipeline to process large co cohorts of human samples before and it had performed really well. And ultimately this was the pipeline we went with. Um, we were really comfortable running the pipeline. It met all of our customization needs and it was capable of processing a really large cohort really fast. Um, and you know, there were a few things though about the pipeline that were restrictive. Um, firstly, it was developed specifically to run at NCI's HPC. Um, so that meant we knew exactly where we had to work. And something that's probably quite undesirable about running the pipeline was the way it's, it's designed. So unlike Cyric and Parabricks, like I said before, users basically need to submit and run a, a separate script for each process. Um, but that allowed us to customize our resource requests and, and um, adjust some of the parameters. Um, and ultimately the jobs we ran with this pipeline were made way more computationally efficient than they would have been um, with the other two options. Uh, so that was a pretty, maybe a bit of a niche example. Probably a lot of you aren't working at that scale, but hopefully it was helpful in um, helping you get a sense of, uh, you know, the decision-making process that you can apply to your own projects. Um, so we're just going to quickly talk about some of the computing options that are available to you. Um, and this is going to be specific uh, to the Australian context, as these are um, federally and institutionally funded. Um, many institutions, uh, research organisations, universities, They'll provide your, their researchers with access to various computing facilities. And this may include something like an, an institutional high performance computer or virtual machines or cloud computing. Um, they often also facilitate our access to, uh, 
to national computational infrastructures, um, same thing, you know, HPCs, cloud computing as well, um, that are provided by NCI and QCIF and PAUSI and ARDC. Um, another platform that's freely available for us to use is the web-based Galaxy platform. Um, it's really popular for some downstream analyses and with researchers working with smaller data sets. Uh, it can be a great alternative to working um, on the command line for some of you, um, but it does really have a lot of resource limitations. So it's not suitable for everything. It doesn't have the same, it doesn't let you have the same kind of control as working at the command line does. Um, in terms of getting access, there are a lot of ways to go about this. The best way is probably to contact your institution's e-research or ICT support services. They're going to be able to provide you with the options that um, are available through your institution. And outside of that, there are public merit schemes that include uh, NCI's adapter scheme and the NC Mass scheme that facilitate access to a number of different infrastructures. Um, we didn't really get an opportunity to talk about uh, you know, how you really to dig into all the resource requirements stuff, um, but something that might be useful for helping you get a head around that um, are these webinars here. So a year ago, we ran some webinars that uh, were really targeted at helping you understand your compute needs for bioinformatics workflows and for getting access to national facilities. Um, they're available on YouTube. And um, uh, as with this webinar, um, all the resources um, that came from those uh, webinars are available on the Australian Biocommons Zenodo page as well. So um, that's basically it with just a few takeaways to, to wrap up. Um, so just remember GATK best practices, while they're widely applicable across a lot of organisms and a lot of different projects, um, there is plenty of room for flexibility in them. So following a best practice guideline where you can is going to be uh, really useful in helping you on your way to high quality and reproducible genomics projects. Um, but there's plenty of room for you to customize the guidelines for your own needs while still being best practice. Um, and just remember that what works for someone else, even if they're working with the same organism, might not work for you. So that means you're going to have to ask um, some questions about your data set in your research question, so you can choose a path that best suits your needs. Um, existing best practice pipelines are out there. Some of them are really great. Um, they might be designed slightly differently. Um, so they all might have their own pros and cons, but chances are you're going to be able to find something, especially for mapping and variant calling, um, that meets your needs um, and uh, meets your command line experience level as well. Um, and finally, national computing infrastructures, including HPCs, virtual machines, and cloud computing is also available to you. You just need to work out what facility suits your needs, um, what, what's best for you, um, and how you can apply to use these. Um, that's it for today. Uh, thanks very much for listening. Um, I think we have a few minutes for questions, if um, anyone has any. Is that right, Melissa? Yes, we definitely have time for questions. Uh, you can write those into the Q&A box and I can see there's been a few coming through as we've been talking. Uh, Tracy's answered a couple of those. Tracy's one of Georgie's colleagues. Um, there's a good question, I think, to start with, and it's a clarification question. And it is, is compute short for compute needs or something else? Oh, sorry. Yes, I found that um, quite confusing as well when I started uh, working uh, at the Sydney Informatics Hub as a bioinformatician. Uh, yeah, by compute, I really mean um, the the uh, the infrastructure and the resources that it provides you. So um, the platforms you might be working on, as well as things like CPU and RAM and um, uh, storage memory as well. Great, that's really helpful. Always good to ask those kind of questions. Yeah, sorry, I should have sure. clarified that one. That's fine. There's always um, different ways of referring things, no matter um, what area you're working in. Let's just have a little look at some of the other questions here. Earlier in the talk, you talked about the, the different protocols that you were using and the amount of time that they were running. And someone has asked the question was, uh, how much manual time is required on top of the wall time in particular for the SIH protocol? Um, for the SIH protocol, you because you're basically uh, you, so you wait you you uh, the scripts are written in a way that you basically need to just um, if you're working at NCI you need to um, uh, work out your own resource needs so you'd need to type them in and then you submit the jobs to the the job scheduler um, wait for the job to to run and then once it's finished you'll need to um, check that it ran. Um, that it ran successfully and then submit the next job. So it is quite a lot of manual intervention. 
and it does really um yeah it does really slow you down thank you um we've talked a bit about nci here and i think that's just because that happens to be the one that you chose for this workflow what are some of the other well, we touched on some of the other resources, but do you also use things like VMs on Pawsey or Nectar in your research too? Yeah, um, so I'm currently doing a couple of projects on um, Pawsey's uh, Nimbus cloud. So they have uh, small VMs. Um, the, you, you just need to, the application process is very easy. You basically just um, fill out a, a short form telling Pawsey what you need. Um, and for this kind of work, I would recommend you probably request a, a larger VM. They have a, a few different flavor options. Um, but yeah, I'm using um, Nimbus to process a data set of 10 whole genome human samples right now. Um, and that's working really nicely. Great, thank you. And if you'd like to know more about some of the things that the Sydney Infomagnets Hub is doing on Nimbus, we have a webinar coming up on that next month. And I'll I'll give you a link to that a little bit later. Uh, quite another question as well is, have you developed Docker for your workflows and is it available? Uh, we haven't used Docker. We prefer, because we work largely on uh, singular um, on HPCs, um, using Docker isn't um, an option for us. So we, to manage containers and stuff, we use uh, Singularity. The, um, the Sydney Informatics Hub mapping and variant calling pipelines don't currently use Singularity because um, NCI have installed all the tools and all the, the right versions of the tools that we use for those pipelines for us. Um, but generally speaking, working on HPCs, um, just generally for bioinformatics and reproducibility, we preference um, Singularity for containers. Great, thank you. So changing track a little bit here, uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of using FastQ as a starting point versus assemblies? Fast A contig scaffolds. I'm reading this out. So if you need more context, please ask. Um, yeah, could you could you give me a little bit more context? Because fast Q files, I'm just really talking about what you get from the sequencing company. If you're going to do alignments using um, uh, fast A files or something, it's it's a different process. You probably use different tools and stuff. Thanks a lot. That was a bit of a tricky question, I think. Maybe this brings us to a question that we had pre-submitted as well, which is what sort of downstream tools are good for annotating and visualizing data? Uh, so I recommend a few different options for uh, you know, visualizing your data. You can visualize your BAM files and your BCF files using, um, you can look at them on the, on the command line. You can look at your, your BAM alignments on the command line using a, a tool called SAM tools. They have a command, a TView command. Um, there are also uh, separate graphical interface programs like um, something called IGV, so Integrative Genomics Viewer, I think it's called. So you can basically load up uh, BAMs for multiple samples and your VCFs as well for multiple samples and kind of compare them and scroll along the genome. That's pretty great. Um, uh, you can also, for visualization, if you really want to, you can use uh, genome browsers to do this. There's often options, especially on the UCSC and Ensemble, to upload custom tracks. So you can upload your variants there and look at them in their context in the reference genome, if you like. Um, and in terms of annotation tools, uh, Ensemble and UCSC, they have their own. Uh, there's a lot of different annotation tools, but you know, UCSC and uh, Ensemble own uh, SNPF and Variant Effect Predictor. Um, there's other tools like ANOVAR and there are some, if you're looking at um, known variants in the population or uh, like disease specific variants, there are a lot of um, web-based uh, databases that you can access um, for those as well. So an example off the top of my head, thought off the top of my head for cancer, there's a cosmic database that might be interesting for you. That's a good one, yes. I used to know the people that worked for that. Um, Sorry, I'm just scrolling through questions. It's sometimes a little bit tricky to keep track of. There's an interesting question about paid versus presumably free pipelines. So in this case, it's SVS suite versus GATK. Do you see any differences between those or advantages or disadvantages to using those? Um, it really, often those pipelines, in, as far as I'm aware, paid like commercially licensed existing pipelines 
um, tend to be optimized. So they're very easy for you to use. They might like the Parabix example. I'm not sure about the SVS example, um, but in terms of the Parabix example that I talked about a little bit, um, uh, it was really easy to run and it was, you know, it's a paid option because it's um, they basically repurposed or slightly rewritten the code of existing um, mapping and variant calling tools to run on a different hardware. So they, they designed it so that it was, uh, they've kind of rewritten the code so it was, could run efficiently on GPUs. Um, so you're really paying for uh, optimization there. Um, and usually a better user experience um, and uh, sometimes better support as well. Um, but yeah, in terms of, of the output, um, uh, sometimes these things can be slightly different. You know, when you when you rewrite code to become more efficient, sometimes you have to give up on some accuracy. You have to kind of sacrifice a bit of accuracy. Um, and oftentimes you, you can find a lot of comparisons um, in the literature. So people have published um, studies where they compare existing uh, commercial versus free options as well. Great answer. Thank you, Georgie. I think we will leave it there for today. So just as we wrap up, I have a couple more things to tell you. So as I mentioned earlier, we have another webinar coming up on the 20th of September, which is also going to be presented by the Sydney Informatics Hub team and the POSI team. And this one will be looking at portable, reproducible and scalable bioinformatics workflows using Nextflow and POSI Nimbus Cloud. So this will touch on some of the NF core workflows that Georgie mentioned and we'll also look at how you can use that on Nimbus Cloud as a, an option for your compute. The information about that webinar, as well as a number of other training events that we have coming up later this year, are on the Biocommons website. So thank you again, Georgie, for sharing your time and expertise with us today. It's a very interesting conversation about workflows and how to think about them. And thank you to everybody for joining us as well. The Australian Biocommons is enabled by NCRIS via Bioplatforms Australia funding. That's all for today, and we hope to see you again soon. Until then, goodbye for now.